So we're fortunate to have as our special guest as part of today's interview series, Mr. John McGrath, founder and executive director of ASX Listed Property Business. McGrath, John, thanks again for, for the opportunity to have you on the program. You grew up in Sydney's South. Tell us a little bit about your upbringing, if you could. Well, it was kind of pretty mediocre mainstream. My, my dad used to run a pub, which is kind of ironic. I don't drink and he unfortunately died as an alcoholic. So it's kind of two ends of the spectrum there. But um, you know, we grew up above a pub um, that his father before him had uh, owned leading in the depression and lost it in the depression. Uh, so it was kind of went full circle. We grew up there. Um, I uh, was pretty good at sport as a kid, very good actually. And I felt, well, that was going to be my future trajectory was sport, not, not business. I didn't do terribly well at school in the classroom, but I did well in the gym. And so my sort of goal as I grew, you know, as I got into my 13, 14, 15 years sort of age group, when you could start telling who was going to actually excel at sport, and I was one of those guys, and who was not going to excel at, in the classroom, and I was one of those guys too. So it kind of looked like it was a good trajectory. And uh, then as it turned out, I ended up having collapsed lungs as a late teen. So my sporting career literally finished overnight. Um, and then I got into, into business. So it was kind of like a, not a particular, I didn't want to follow my father, you know, being a non-drinker and someone that goes to bed at eight o'clock at night, being a publican was never going to be a, a career trajectory for me. So uh, playing for, you know, the Roosters who were, I was playing representative for was my goal. One day play for the Roosters and then hopefully Australia, um, but cut, cut short by an injury. So two collapsed lungs as an 18 year old, how do you rebound from something like that and where did you see your life heading at that time? Well, I kind of, it, it happened upon me, I didn't understand, I had an operation, at the end of the operation I said to the doctor, how long before I can train? And he said, well you can probably walk in a couple of weeks, then you can jog a few weeks later. Um, and I said, and what about play football? And he said, well that's, you can't play football again, you can't have anything that would risk um, impact on your lungs. So I was like literally there thinking, what the hell am I going to do now? I started selling cars as an apprentice car salesman, if you will. But that was really just something to do to earn some pocket money while I trained for football. And I didn't really like selling cars. I liked the people I was working with. I liked serving people, but I didn't really like cars as a product. And now I didn't, couldn't do football. I got a bad HSC mark because I hadn't really tried that hard in the classroom. Um, and then so I'm stuck with what do I do next. So I went to a, um, a careers advisory centre in Surrey Hills, in Kippack Street in Surrey Hills and back in those days and I asked them, can, can you show me all the options? They gave me a book from A to Z, all the career options and I got, I got to real estate and it kind of looked like it was an interesting profession. I thought, well I'm going to have to do something now for 50 years that I really love, so what could that look like? I remember watching a speech that uh, Steve Jobs gave, I think it was a Harvard, um, Harvard School speech and he says that, you know, your life, you, as you look back in life you eventually join the dots and um, but it's not until after, afterwards you join the dots. And I think that was one of those times that I now look at it and real estate's been an amazing career for me and a great life. And, and I'm quite lucky that I had collapsed lungs because it forced me to take another career path. Only because I think back in those days, um, most real, uh, sports people, sorry, most sports people are retired by 28, 29. And many of them back in those days anyway, didn't have particularly fulfilling careers thereafter. Um, so that probably, could have been a path that I would have taken. So long story short, uh, um, I was pleased, I was devastated momentarily. I threw myself into real estate, like I used to throw myself into sport. Uh, the reason I think I was good at sport was not because of any natural talent, it was because I w trained hard, I worked hard, I modeled the best, I visualized, I did all the things you know that were important to be a good sports person and they all came together and they gave me a certain outcome. So I just now poured that into real estate and it ended up, you know, sort of fairly early days being quite a good decision to make. And where do you think the hard work and that discipline was instilled into you from? Was it your father that had that sort of influence? Um, I was probably too young. He, he, he passed away or he left my mother. They, they separated then he passed away when I was relatively young. So I didn't have first-hand experience so much of him and they had a not a particularly great marriage um, so it wasn't uh, you know we just weren't very close as a family I think it was to be quite frank Rob was out of fear I was fearful that having now my dream of playing for Australia was gone and then I was fearful of just being one of millions of a sea of faces many people are pretty miserable 
they never really achieve as much as they would probably have dreamt once upon a time. And I was petrified that, you know, maybe after this dream of playing for Australia, what if I just kind of ended up living what I might deem a, a mediocre life? So I thought, well, God, I better start doing something to get some momentum elsewhere out, outside of sport. So real estate happened to be it. And take us through your, your first experiences of real estate. As I understand it, it was two years or so working in property management down at Bondi Junction. Tell us about that. Yeah, look, it was great. I was very thankful to get the job uh, because I'd had such a poor mark in my HSC. And when you're 18, 19, the HSC is kind of the best barometer for potential employers to look at. How, have you got an HSC and how'd you go? And because I didn't do well, I had to go for a lot of jobs before I got this one at Gresham Hawkins at Bono Junction. It was a letting clerk, so I basically just rented flats and then I became a property manager about a year later. Um, it, was the, it gave me the first opportunity to prove to someone that I was worthy of the investment. And so Ken Gresham, Mr. Gresham was my boss. Uh, he gave me the, the, the go ahead. Um, and it was, it was terrific. I wrote down this list of things I was going to do and I remember the list clearly. You know, one was I wanted to give people the best service experience of their life. I'd read books about service, I'd read books like The E-Myth, I'd you know, read up on great companies. There's no internet in those days, so it was all kind of like the old-fashioned book stuff. And I'd go into the library and then to Dimmicks and I'd buy or rent books and um, I'd look at it and I'd say, okay, well, um, great service experience, critical. Then I thought about what would constitute a great service experience. Well, turn up on time, be punctual, present yourself properly, have the right uh, knowledge about the product, treat people with courtesy, follow up on all your promises. So I kind of started writing these things down. Then I said, well, I'm going to write work seven days a week, seven till seven. Kind of had a ring to it. I thought, well, I got nothing else. I had no relationship. I had no kids. I had no other commitments. I might as well throw myself into it. So I was virtually working 12 hours a day, seven days a week, even though the business was only open till 12 o'clock on Saturday. So business was open five and a half. But I thought, I don't want to just do what everyone else is doing because then I'll kind of, again, just get what everyone else is getting. So I threw myself into it. I showed properties on Sundays. I worked back late at night. Uh, I did a range of things which, as I look back again, were catalysts for fast growth. So in a year's time, they put me up to a property manager. And then a year after that, I chose to shift companies, which was a hard decision because they'd given me my first start. But they were not really a sales type company. They were more pro uh, property management. So I found another company in an area that I wanted to work, which is Paddington in Sydney. Um, that gave me a start as a 20 year old salesperson. So property management was a terrific grounding. It was the first opportunity to prove to someone that I was worth it. Um, it was the ability to create some momentum and good habits uh, regard, regarding complaint handling, time management, looking after clients, um, those sort of things. And what about the transition from property management into sales? How, how did you find that? Well, it was kind of exciting but tough. I thought because I was in great momentum in property management, I'd just do the same thing and I'd immediately get into great momentum in sales. But it took me six months to sell my first property. And after the first three months, I was starting to lose confidence. Um, I was starting to think maybe I am too young, which my previous boss had said, you know, 20 years of age, you're too young to get into sales. And uh, I thought, well, maybe he was right. And it took me six months. And I remember 28 Norfolk Street Paddington was my first sale. And I reckon that sale saved my career and maybe my career trajectory would have been very different because I kind of got a sale and then I got a second one soon after and then a third one, then I, I built momentum. Um, so it was tougher than I thought. I, as I look back, Rob, I think a lot of the people that I was serving, buyers and sellers, were either my parents or my grandparents' age. And I think I look back then and I was a little pimply faced guy that was enthusiastic but no life experience. and no real real estate experience to speak of and I'm asking someone to give me a key to their property to look after it, their biggest investment of their life. And so I'm, I guess again not surprised um, looking back that it was a little bit hard to build the initial momentum but once I got into momentum your confidence, like anyone, you know, like your confidence builds once you get a role and then you kind of walk into a meeting with a different uh, energy about you. So that happened but its first six months was very slim pickings. Speaking of momentum, you gained momentum in a significant way following the sale of the Bang & Olufsen house in Point Piper for a then record of $11.25 million. What impact did that have on you and, and what impact did it have in growing your confidence? Well, that, that was uh, 
that probably took me five years ahead of where I would have been. So um, Willie Porteous from Perth um, gave me a call one day. He was an agent in Perth, a friend of mine. He said, John, um, Brian Johnson is a friend of mine. He has a house in Point Piper. He says it's probably worth 15 million. Um, can you meet him? He'd like to interview a few agents. And I said, Willie, uh, I've never sold in Point Piper. My highest sale price ever was a million dollars. So at this stage, I was like 27, 28. So I was doing well in Paddington, selling Paddo Terraces. But like, this is a whole different category. Like, this is stepping up to Group 1, you know, Ritz Carlton type stuff. And I'd been selling the kind of middle of the road. Because Paddington, you've got to remember in those days, was not the kind of sought after suburb. So it was kind of a little bohemian pocket of inner Sydney. So, um, he, and I said, Willie, I don't want to embarrass you because I said, I'd love to handle a $15 million property, but I've never done anything like that. So I remember putting the phone down, um, landline in those days, because there's no mobiles. And then I just started thinking to myself, God, you know, why didn't I say I'll turn up? At least I could see what a $15 million house looked like and I could meet a VIP and I could practice. And so I literally picked the phone up a couple of minutes later and I said, Willie, I'd love to be introduced. Um, I won't embarrass you. I'm sure I won't get the business but I won't embarrass you. So I did all the research between now and when I met Mr. and Mrs. Johnson a few days later. I turned up, I gave the best, I think the best pitch of my life. Uh, I was very upfront. Um, I said, Mr. Johnson, you know, I've never sold a property of this price range. In fact, I've never sold in this suburb, but I don't think you'll ever meet an agent that's more passionate, more committed, that's more thorough than I am. And this means a lot more to me than I suspect it will mean to others, although it'll mean a lot to anyone. Anyway, he rang me a few days later from Perth when he went back and he said, you know, you reminded me when I was young, when I started my building business. He said, I like your approach. He said, I'm going to put you on the job. So um, I got to be, you know, uh, the agent uh, handling the sale of it with Willie. You know, we did it together and then eventually Bart Doff brought a buyer from Double Bay and he was a legend. So I got to work in close proximity to him, which is a bonus. So again, I look back and when I'm talking to my own staff, I say, you know, you've got to back yourself because you don't know what's out there. You don't know how good or not so good you are. You just go out and give it your best shot. And I think it took me five years further afield than I would have if I had just not rung him back and not got the listing and then not sold it. Following the completion of that sale a few months later, you then launched your own business being McGrath Estate Agents in 1988. Take me through the, the genesis of wanting to create your own business. What was the vision? Well, I wanted to be the best real estate salesperson on the planet. Was, that was my goal. At some point, four or five years into my real estate career, I kind of figured that I needed to be in an environment that was going to allow that to happen. And with great respect to my late boss, John O'Brien, who I was working for at the time, I kind of felt it was a bit old fashioned. It was, it was not going to support me to get to the, the next level. So. I figured I had to go and do it myself. I asked him if I could invest in his business. At that point, he didn't want any outside investment or partners. So I went and started from the lounge room, and then I went to a serviced office a few minutes, a few months later, uh, and I started from nothing. And fortunately, I was naive enough to not know how much money I should have had to start, how much experience, and how many courses I hadn't done. I just figured that if I was good at selling real estate, that's all you needed. So I jumped in and, and then I, I, even when I was recruiting people, the first half a dozen recruits were people outside the real estate industry because I was this, this kind of little guy on the hill with this unknown brand, which was really my brand that I started from nothing. And to go and try and recruit someone working for one of the big brands, LJ Hooker, Richardson and Wrench, Rain and Horn, which are all the big brands at the moment, it was, I thought it would be impossible. So I started going around to people that I knew that I thought had talent that were not in real estate and I said, you know, have you ever thought about getting into real estate? Why don't you come and you know, do a few Saturdays with me? You'll enjoy it. So the first half a dozen uh, employees were non-real estate. Um, and then it sort of just grew from there. I was able to coach them and train them in my way. And they got momentum. And then others that were experienced started looking across the garden fence and saying, what are you guys doing? You know, I'm seeing you know, a lot of your boards popping up. Um, and we used to do things very differently. You know, everyone else was putting photographs. I used to use pencil sketches because I thought, well, it's different. Everyone else was auctioning in a boardroom or a meeting room. I was auctioning at the property on site. Um, I introduced floor plans when no one else had ever used floor plans into the market. Um, all of these kind of little little different things, you know, none of them in isolation game changes, but you layer upon layer, which I think business is about, 
Rarely does a business come up with a brand new idea that's like so different, like just the world gravitates. And you look at something like Uber of late. I mean, people are still getting in a car at one end and getting out of a car at the other end, but they've taken away the pain points of ordering the car and paying the bill and all those sort of things. They've added in some things like rating the driver and rating the passenger. And I guess, you know, back in those days, I was trying to do the little things like that, still auctioning and selling real estate, but just finding little points of difference that I thought were customer advantageous. So that was kind of how it all started from there. And, uh, you know, so we went from one office Seven years later, I opened the second office, and today we've got about 110. Incredible story. The, the business launches in 88, steadily grows, then in 91, the stock market crash occurs and Australia's in a recession. What impact did that have on you? Well, again, fortunately, I was so naive, and I just, I didn't know it was going to be a good or a bad time to open, and even when I'm in the midst of it, I knew there was a lot of bad negative media, but just sell, 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 sell as many properties, and just cross your fingers and hope that you can pay the bills. Um, and it worked out. So, yeah, even to this day, Rob, I, I avoid watching too much about what's in the media because most of it's negative and just fills your mind with things that you don't want to be thinking about. Um, I focus very little on competitors and with respect because I have some great competitors, but I, I focus on what we're doing. I focus on the things that we can control, which is not the stock market, which is not the, the competition, which is not the weather, which is not the interest rate environment it's just like what we do and how we do it so I've kind of always had that approach even back to my sporting days I didn't focus too much on the competition I just focus on my own skills and my own attitude over the prevailing five or so years the business bounces back and begins to embark on a period of relatively rapid growth if I'm not mistaken you undertook market analysis during this time to look at the franchise model you'd seen the success at groups like Century 21 Coldwell Banker and Ray White had had. What, what, what sort of analysis did you do and, and what impact did you foresee that would have on, on growing the McGrath franchise model? Look, to be frank, I'd love to think the analysis was detailed and sophisticated. It was kind of like, shit, we want more offices, but I can't really afford to open more offices and it's getting harder and harder to manage them. So what's this franchising thing all about? So I would read articles and uh, again, it sounds pretty crude, but I just read articles in, in business magazines about franchising and McDonald's and, you know, McDonald's was, you know, the, the, and probably to this day still is one of the great franchise models in the world. So I just look at what they did and why they did it. And then I, I mentioned earlier, I read a book called The E-Myth, which, you know, really taught me about the importance of systems and creating systems to leverage and scale your skills and your ability. And franchising allowed us to do that. And then I hired a lawyer who was, or I engaged a lawyer who was kind of um, good at franchising. And I said, can you do a set of conditions for me? Please make them simple. Please make them small, not large. Because I've always been of the philosophy that the easier you can make it to do business with you, the better. So whether you're an agent, a franchisee, a vendor, or a buyer, it's my job to make it easy for you to achieve your goal. And um, so I'm always trying to kind of keep the simple concept going throughout the business even more so as we grow because it's very easy to get complex in the world of business it's actually very hard to stay simple so I'm always trying to sort of take things away rather than add too many things on to what we do. Aligned with this vision was a preference to pursue a hub and spoke model rather than opening an office on a suburb by suburb basis what was the the basis of your thinking in this regard? Yeah so great question I went overseas because again in those early days there was no internet and literature was limited. So I actually went on a few, I took myself on a few study tours overseas. And I found a few companies, one of them in, the, uh, in England was Foxton's, great company. And I studied their model and I met their CEO and then I went to America and I found a few other companies. There's one called Corcoran's in New York City. And I realized that the Australian model of lots and lots of small offices in every suburb, which was kind of the, the big franchise model, it felt to me outdated and it felt and this was before internet I think as internet came in it clearly was even more outdated so I um, I studied what they did I found out that most of them had a few big what they called super offices or regional offices and they equipped those with you know lovely comfortable seating and baristas in the corner and reception lounges and lots of meeting rooms and training rooms and all the things that you couldn't have in a little 70 square meter local suburban office so I thought, well, that makes sense to me. So I started creating bigger offices 
and um, it, it worked, it attracted people in. But then I did recognise that there are certain communities all around Australia that uh, for whatever reason, they're kind of, let's call them villages, and the locals there kind of want to buy and use local services. Uh, it's, not, it's not the same for every suburb, but I realised that some places I had to have a physical presence and I had to have a specialist that lived in the area and had breakfast in the area and went to bed in the area. Um, and there are other areas that were sort of had a different approach. So, The other aspect of growth that I wanted to ask you about was some of the offices are still today company owned and some are franchised out. What, what guides you thinking in, in that regard? Well, it's an interesting point. We've got about 27 company owned offices and about 110 total, so call it sort of 80 odd uh, franchise. Going forward, we will grow through franchise because then we can tap into the best of local leadership and we can incentivize people through local ownership. We will still own some company stores, but less. I think we'll have a fewer number and probably larger company stores in the next few years. Um, look, th there's no doubt that when you have a local leader who has skin in the game, in the office every morning, turning the lights on and off, that has a magic to it that's very hard to replicate in a corporate sense. So whilst we've been delighted that we've had 27 offices and they've all been, or most of them have been stellar performers, we do think the time has probably come as we put the foot on the pedal to expand into new territories to probably um, convert some of those offices to franchise. But, you know, it's a people business, you know, you've got to look after your people and there is some limit to the bandwidth that you can really do when it comes to that. Speaking of growth into new territories, business was obviously started in Sydney, then grew into Queensland and more recently into Victoria. Was that something that was pre-planned all along or is that something that sort of occurred either via growth by acquisition or just organic growth? Look, disappointingly for perhaps your viewers, none of this was planned. You know, my, my, my second office was after seven years and it was because I was getting all these people from the north side of the harbour saying, can you sell our property, can you sell our property and where's your office? Oh, you're in the eastern suburbs. So I kind of was like forced to do that and then the same thing happened in other areas. And then I had a couple of young guys started and they lived in the Shire, south of Sydney. And they said, oh, we're really keen to open an office, can we? So these things kind of, there was some vague plan, but I would say in a sense, there was as much uh, opportunism than there was strategic direction. So I knew I didn't necessarily want to be, I certainly didn't want to be in every suburb. I didn't probably want to be in every part of Australia because I knew that it's hard enough managing an office an hour away, let alone you know six hours away on a plane and car to get to an office on Western Australia somewhere. So you know I sort of have had definitely a strategic focus on East Coast Australia um, and Australia in isolation of elsewhere. Um, definitely a future focus on franchise. Uh, definitely a preference towards coastal, regional and higher net worth lifestyle areas. So I've had a few building blocks, but beyond that, I mean, I do think these 20, 30 page business plans are a bit overrated. I've always had one page plans. So here's how many offices we want. Here are kind of the areas, but we'll look at a few others if they pop up. Tasmania, we've just opened in Tasmania and we love Tasmania. We've got two going to three offices soon in Tassie. The reason we didn't start there, not because we didn't love Tasmania, but we didn't have the right person to partner with and then one of the best young talents in the business rings up and says John you know that I work for this other brand I would love to take a franchise so embarrassingly he came to us we probably should have been knocking on his door but anyway it didn't happen um, and uh, so we embraced that and then all of a sudden when the news got out that he was joining us we got all these other inquiries so I, I think that you need to have a strategic direction you need to have a philosophy and some building blocks that you build upon, but I reckon most businesses probably overrate the need to have a minute, detailed plan of many pages. The business listed on the ASX in around about September 2015. Reflecting on that decision, what, what was the opportunity that you saw to list on the public markets and what are the key learnings out of that? Well, look, I'll be absolutely transparent, which I always am. I was not that keen to list on the market. Others, at that point, to retain, incentivise and attract some good people, I'd sold down about 16% of the business. So I owned 84%, certainly the vast majority, and there was a number, there was about 10 other people that had 
there was a big push from them to list the company on the, the, the COO at the time was very keen. He was in their ear saying this would be a great way for us to increase the value of our investment and then one day be able to liquidate our investment. And, you know, I guess I felt there was a lot of pressure to do it. And, you know, you can't always get your own way. Even if you own 100%, sometimes there is a uh, uprise of, you know, desire from board, advisors, staff, employees or whatever. So I kind of felt at the time, all right, I, was, I allowed myself to be convinced into it. The logic to a degree was, and, and still is, I think it's fair to say now we're in that space, we're embracing it and we're going to use it to the best of our advantage. The idea was um, attract, consolidate the industry to a degree because the industry is highly fragmented, engage with people and bring them on board and allow the ability for them to either invest themselves or be granted shares that are liquid and easy to identify in terms of value. And um, so that was the philosophy. Um, we missed our numbers and have probably been struggling to catch up ever since then. First time we missed our numbers, the market, the listings fell off a cliff. Um, no one knew, just happened. One of those things that, were, that you know, a couple of months after we listed, the, sh the real estate market just sort of tightened up. We lost, missed the numbers and it's been tough since then. However, going forward, um, you've got to make the best with what you've got. Um, and I think that there is an opportunity for us to still consolidate. No one in the market has consolidated, um, which could be potentially down the track multi-brand strategy. We might have two or three brands. Um, certainly incentivise and attract good people into the brand with share marketing or share option packages. So I think it's, you know, not everything goes the way you plan. Um, and sometimes you've got to step out and do something different. Sometimes you've just got to um, make the best of it, which is what we're doing now. I thought we'd move on to a few more general topics. Let's begin with the traditional real estate model. I'm, I'm interested to get your gauge on whether that's changed over the years and if so, how it's changed. Look, I think a lot of things have stayed the same. Clearly, digital, social have become preeminent when it comes to marketing property to all parts of the world, relatively cost effectively. Uh, I think the thing that's changed the most would be what we call EBUs, effective business units, agent teams within an office. So within our, our top 25 agents would be amongst the best in the world. We're fortunate, blessed to have them on our team. All of our agents, but the top 25 are right up there. And most of them would have teams of between two and six people working under them. Now that was unheard of. Well, I go back to when I was selling you, if you were an agent, it was you and that's it. And there'd be receptionist or secretary at the front of the office that would do all the paperwork for everyone and that would be, that'd be all. Things have changed. I think agents have got smart at leveraging, scaling up their own businesses. Most have continued to choose to work within a brand because they like the support and they don't want to deal with all the stuff that brands have to deal with. But they've, they've almost built businesses, well they have built businesses within a business. That to me is the biggest change that I've seen over the last decade. Clearly you're a strong people person and a great leader. I'm interested to hear your approaches to how you manage egos uh, across, and personalities across the, the journey of business that you've been involved in. I, I think it'd be fair to say that uh, managing the highest performers is often the most challenging task. Whether you're in a sporting environment or whether you're in a business environment, people that are elite at what they do, sometimes that comes with big egos, um, sense of entitlement, and as I said before, we are blessed. Most of our top people are absolutely humble and they contribute and they're generous. But you will find from time to time, you know, people's egos, you know, get in front of them and it becomes hard. So how do I deal with that? Consistency over the years, transparency and consistency. So we have one rate card for commission, we don't vary it. Um, it varies based on your performance, but we don't do one for you and one for you and one for you because we like you more than we like you. So we're very consistent, and I think we've built a framework that people have relied on that is transparent. Um, I think you've just got to, it's a people business. You've got to be on the phone every day. I would spend probably two or three hours every day on the phone, often to my top franchisees, top achieving agents, uh, managers, and just checking in, you know, how's everything going? Are you stuck in anything? How'd you go yes to those meetings? Knowing what's happening at a grassroots level is critical. So I keep my finger on the pulse of as much as I can of what they're doing, 
I know when they've got big auctions coming up, I'll ring them and wish them luck. I'll call them on the Saturday night, congratulating them as a result. Little things like that really win credits in the emotional bank account of leadership and people do remember that. So for a company that's kind of of our scale and volume and with the number of high achievers we've got, I am very fortunate that the number of incidents that come up that are too challenging to handle are very limited. One quote that I thought stood out when I was researching this was you previously mentioned life is all about falling over. You've got to get back up for all of us. You've got to keep going until that game change moment, that one shot to make a difference. Reflecting on, on your career, how have you been able to overcome adversity and, and overcome challenges? Well, I think just that when you've got a paradigm or a belief system that says for me to be able to achieve a large scale success, there are going to be lots and bumps and bruises along the way. So then it's not a surprise. And when I'm coaching and mentoring young guys, girls that are coming through the ranks, I'll often share that with them because sometimes you're coaching them before they've had too many bruises. Um, and yet there are other times they've had those bruises and you're coaching them and say, well, this is just part of the course. Welcome to the world of business. Success generally polarizes people. People go one way or the other. They either love your success and want to read about you and, and model you, and the other people hope that you, you know, that you fall off the off the step as you as you're leaving the office at night. Um, so I think that for me, it's just been a philosophy. And uh, if you're a salesperson, it's exactly the same. You know, you got to. We know in every community, six percent sells each year. To find the six percent, you got to talk to the hundred percent, of which ninety-four percent are not sellers. So if I just use that model with agents and they get it, and I say, well, you've got to knock 100 doors to find the six that are thinking of selling. So don't be worried about the 94 that say no thanks. That's actually a path along the way to you finding the six. So I think it's all about a philosophy. And then you've got to, you know, you've got to thicken your skin a bit. Reflecting on your career in general, what are the, the key lessons or the key pieces of advice that you can share? Business never outpaces its leader or leaders. So for a business to grow, you need to have uh, a constantly growing, evolving leadership team. And sometimes that means some people out, some people in. Some, hopefully, it means the people that are in stay there, but they just keep growing and growing and growing. Uh, I don't think you can just spend your way through marketing to more success. I think your, your leadership, certainly the leader and the leadership team need to keep growing. So I think that was um, an important one. Um, I think there's just, you know, like I believe in things like karma and I think if you just look after people, staff, customers, uh, suppliers, do the right thing over time, you play the long game, that comes back. Sometimes you need a favour from a supplier because something's gone wrong and, you know, they remember all the good things you've done over the years. Um, I think win-win deals are important. I say to all my agents or if we're ever acquiring a company, I said, look, it's either win-win or it's not going to be sustainable. If I walk away thinking I've, I've done the deal but it doesn't feel right, or you do, so I said we need to find a midpoint where we're all satisfied with the outcome. So I think, you know, you've got to take a generous... John, John Simon, and I don't know if you've interviewed John for your program, but he's, he's, he was a great mentor to me, and um, John used to talk to me about leading with generosity. And he said, always be generous with your people. You know, if in doubt, give them a little bit more. You know, just do a bit more, give them a bit more. And so that's kind of one that's always stuck with me. And if I'm talking to a franchisee and they're saying, oh, we're in this situation, and I say, look, just whatever it is, err on the side of generosity and you'll end up winning as a result. There are some important ones. I'm a great believer in high standards, extraordinarily high standards and extreme ownership. So what are high standards are whatever the industry is doing, how can you get above that? You don't have to be double that, but you've got to be above it really to attract uh, excellence and customers. The extreme ownership is well, no matter what happens in your business, as a leader or a leadership team, you have to own it. So don't blame. And when an agent comes back to me and said, oh, I lost a deal, I said, why'd you lose the deal? Oh, the competitor was 1%. I said, no, no, you, that's not why you lost it. You lost it because the client couldn't see the difference, so they chose the cheaper option. If they perceive that you are up here when it comes to expertise in handling the sale of their property and the 1% guy was down here, then they would still hire you. So extreme ownership says you've got to own the outcome no matter what, and then you learn and evolve from that. Two more questions to finish. What, what motivates you to keep working each day? You're clearly passionate about real estate and property, but what motivates you to turn up to the office and, and solve issues and solve challenges and, and stay motivated? It's a great question. I think I really want to make a difference, and I hope I've made some difference to date. 
but I know between now and when I finish real estate, which probably will never be never because I just can't see any reason I'd ever want to stop doing what I love, um, I want to keep making a difference. And that is to my people here in the business, that is to their customers, that is to the communities that we serve. All of those things are important and that is to the planet. You know, we're very big on environmental sustainability. We think that ethical brands in the future are going to be the brands, the only brands that win. Because I think people are sick and tired of seeing corporations, companies, small business, large business make lots of money and yet, you know, rape and pillage the planet and, and sort of, you know, pollute and all those sort of things. So we're believers that we, as a real estate agent, we, we sort of have tentacles into the community. We touch a lot of people. We meet a lot of people. We interact with a lot of businesses. So we think, fortunately, we think we have the ability to be a bit of an influencer within a community. And now with 110 offices and soon 250, there'll be 250 communities that we think we can touch. So um, that's for me. And I just, it's like, whatever you do, if you're a sports person, you want to reach the pinnacle. You want to win the Super Bowl. You want to win the grand final. I'm a business person now. I'm a real estate guy. And I want to reach the highest possible limits. And I want to create the best real estate company in the history of the world. Not from an ego perspective, not even from a financial perspective, although I know inevitably achieving those results, there will be some rewards that flow to all shareholders, of which I am one. But I just figure if you're gonna do something seven days a week in the entirety of your life or the vast majority of your life, why would you wanna stop somewhere short of your best, the company's best, making a massive difference changing the planet, all the kind of things that we aspire to do. So it's kind of easy to jump out of bed when you've got those goals. Where do you look to for inspiration? And I suppose the second part of that is, what, what does that inspire you to achieve? You've mentioned the, the business aspect there, but in your personal life as well. Well, my personal and, bi and my business life are very much intertwined and, and I don't regret that. I think it's, it's one of the beauties that, you know, people talk about the lines between work and home and, you know, kind of, it's, it's not, a, I, I have time off and I you know, have certain boundaries when I will turn the phone off, but I just never stop thinking about real estate and I never stop thinking about business. I never stop thinking about McGrath and our team. So um, yeah, I think that uh, it, it's, it's been a, an inc incredibly good ride for me to date, but I still think my best work and the company's best work is absolutely yet to come. Um, I think that the personal side is fulfilling because as I said before, I don't think you can grow as a business leader without growing as a human being as well. So I think you have to get better at, at everything, dealing with personal rejection as well as business rejection, um, dealing with multitasking, dealing with prioritization, dealing with uh, complaints and, and challenges within a business and still being able to stay focused on the future. So I, I do think um, that um, both of them are very, uh, very much embedded within each other. John McGrath, one of the great Australian business success stories of all time. Thanks so much for the opportunity to share your journey. Thanks, Rob. Thanks for having me on the show.